So I have a few comments about uh, about the notation. So many people have, you know, I've I've mentioned it time and again, but I have to mention it again. When you write x dot, you have to write it as a function of time. When you write f of x comma u, x dot equals f of x comma u, it doesn't mean anything, okay? Because x is a function of time, x is a function of time, u is a function of time. So f is not acting on two functions of time or two signals. It's acting at these signals evaluated at time t. So this is this is wrong, and the correct way to write is x dot t equals f of x t and u t. Okay, this is the correct way to write it because f acts on x evaluated at time t and u evaluated at time t. F doesn't act on the entire signal x and the entire signal u. So many people have made this mistake in their report and some have I've deducted marks if I've seen this, uh, this thing recurring in the report, uh, then I've deducted marks. If this is just one off place where somebody forgot to mention it, then I've ignored it. Uh, so please make sure that whenever you write something which is a function of something else, you have to explicitly mention what it is a function of. Um, it's a bad practice. Even though you might read a lot of papers written in this fashion, it's a bad practice. So you should avoid, uh, avoid that. You know, in some cases, there was an equation written j equals integral of c x u dt. Okay, and maybe 0 to tf. Okay, again, this is, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, it doesn't make any sense because C, which is the cost function, depends on xt and ut. Okay, it's not a function of signals. And j is a function of u. Okay, j is not a function of ut. Some people had written j of u of t. j is not a function of ut. Okay, u evaluated at t. j is a function of the entire signal u. So this is wrong. This is wrong, and the right way to write it is j of u equals integral 0 to tf, c of xt, ut, dt. This is the right way to right way to write whatever you want to write. Okay, so j acts on the entire signal u, and c is evaluated at x at time t and u at time t, and you integrate it from 0 to tf. Okay, so I hope that makes it clear. Okay, so when you write a paper, the reader has to be extremely clear about what you are trying to do. Okay, if I am not clear, I'll reject your paper. Okay, that's not good for you. It adds additional delays in your timeline, um, and that's not good for your PhD or for your masters or for whatever you are doing. And remember, as a writer, your first and only job is to convince the reader that what you are doing is important. Okay, that's all your job is. And if you make such mistakes, you distract the reader, and the reader will be completely demotivated to read whatever you have to say. And, and that's the last thing you want to do if you are the writer of a document that you expect someone else to read. Okay. So the topic today is uh, one of the most exciting topics, especially in recent times, which is Markov decision problems. And I think the history dates back to 1930s or 40s. Okay, and the idea is as follows. You have a robot, you have sent it to uh, You have sent it to uh, some, let's say you have a land rover and you have sent it to mountains to do something, okay? And the robot doesn't know what exactly it's going to encounter in the future, okay? So what do you expect to see in mountains? Well, you expect to see rocks, you expect to see trees, you expect to see small shrubs, 
and you expect to probably see a path on which you want the robot to navigate. Okay, but the robot as such doesn't have the entire map of what is where. Okay, and so there is some uncertainty in robots mind or in, in robots computational system, there is some uncertainty about what it expects to see when it is actually walking on the path. So how do you model such situation? So that's one situation where there is some uncertainty due to nature. Okay, so nature is controlling the uncertainty in that robot. You're flying a plane and there is winds, okay, and you don't quite know how the wind is going to look like when you're flying from, let's say, here to Columbus to Detroit or Columbus to New York. Okay, so the wind imposes some sort of uncertainty on your plane, and that again is controlled by nature. You're playing a chess, and you have an opponent who's going to take some moves, who's going to make some moves, and you don't quite know how the opponent is going to play in the next five or 10 or 15 moves. Okay, so that's an uncertainty, but that's imposed by the player who's sitting right in front of you. That's imposed by another strategic entity, but Modeling another strategic entity makes your problem difficult, makes your problem very hard. So you want to simplify the problem, so you expect that the opponent is imposing some uncertainty on your, on your system, right? And you want to model that also as a Markov decision problem. So in this case, even though the uncertainty arising from a strategic entity, you assume that the strategic entity is going to play randomly and you expect that to be some sort of noise on your system. I mean, that's a modeling simplification that you need to do in order to make your life easier, okay? But in all these problems, <coughs> there is one thing for sure, that the state of the system is changed not due to your own behavior, but also due to the behavior of some external entity that you do not control whatsoever. Okay, and so that comes under the purview of Markov decision problems, where you assume that your state is at time t plus one is xt plus one, which is a function of xt ut, which is your action, and wt, which is the noise. Okay, so this noise could be due to nature which is in the case of robots or flying aircrafts or quadrotors or uh, bipedal robots and whatnot. And you could also have noise that are adversarial or controlled by someone else. Controlled by some other person. Okay, so those of you who might have looked at videos of Boston Dynamics, you know, they will show videos of kicking a robot or something, okay, and the robot stabilizes itself. So that's an adversarial situation uh, where a person is actively trying to damage a robot. Um, but, but if you don't want to model it in a very complicated manner, you just model it as a noise on the system, okay, but a large noise on the system. So that's an abstraction uh, you need to make in order to make your life easier. So this is the state, this is the state equation. So you have, uh, in the deterministic system, there was no noise, so your xt plus one was a function of xt and ut, and now there is noise in the system which could be controlled by some external uh, entity, and so your state transitions according to xt, ut, and this noise term. Okay, and when you have uncertainty, then you need to define also what information you have at time t, okay? Uh, in deterministic system, all you need is information about the initial state. But when you have stochastic system, like a system of this type where you have noise, it really, the problem formulation really depends on what information you have acquired until time t before you actually pick your action ut. So typically, uh, 
this notion of information only arises in stochastic system and deterministic x naught pretty much predicts what trajectory you are going to follow once you have determined what your strategy or what your policy is going to be. So typically in this case the information ht which is which stands for history at time t depends on the information at time t and you could have multiple information possible so your ht could be just x naught your ht this is open loop okay those of you who have taken feedback controls know that open loop doesn't work well in reality because of these uncertainties so in many cases you could have x naught to xt so you have the entire history of states okay so when you're flying from columbus to new york you know exactly which path you have traced so far into um, in in your in your entire journey right so that's the ht here you could have ht which is x naught a naught x1 a1 and xt okay or you could have ht is equal to xt okay so these are various types of information that you could acquire at time t okay so this is open loop this is closed loop okay so in closed loop you have the instantaneous state okay you have forgotten the entire history you're going to new york all you know is where you are standing right now you don't know which path you have traced until now okay you have forgotten which path you have traced you've forgotten how you came to that point all you know is this is the point i'm standing at the moment so that's closed loop in this case you remember x not which is the initial state initial action next state next action and so on all the way up to xt so you have the full history okay you have you know completely whatever has happened so far what what states you have visited and what are the actions that you have taken in the past and in this case you don't remember your past actions all you remember are the states okay so you remember the trajectory but not the actions that you have taken so you could define information in multiple ways in this stochastic problem okay and then of course you need to figure out uh what your policy is going to be so you define the policy control policy it's also called decision policy it's gamma t which maps uh the state x xt to the action space at okay typically the state space and the action space won't change oh sorry i i didn't mean xt i mean ht so ht would be the space of all possible history that you remember okay so this is the set of set of all possible history okay so a policy maps the information to action okay that's the policy and you have j which is the performance index as a function of policy which is gt plus 1 xt plus 1 and you want to take the expected value plus summation t equal 0 to capital t gt xt ut uh uh 
I should. So this is your expected cost, expected total cost, given that you are going to pick your action according to your policy, gamma t, and the history, ht, that you observe. Okay, and this is this j, which is the expected cost function, is actually a function of your policy. Okay, it's not a function of your action; it's a function of your policy. And in these class of problems, uh, you could have t uh, could be t could be less than infinity. It's called finite horizon. MDP and you have T equals infinity which is infinite horizon MDP okay so there are multiple ways by which you can formulate this problem okay Any question so far? Okay. Now when you have infinite horizon, when this t goes to infinity and you don't have any terminal cost because there is no t capital T plus 1, uh, you get into trouble because the summation of cost will blow up, right? It can go. If you have infinite sum of something which is positive number it's going to become equal to infinity right so typically when you have infinite horizon mdp you talk about j the performance index is defined as expected value of summation t equals 0 to infinity of some discount factor, let's say eta raised to t, gt, xt, at. Okay. Ut. Okay, so that's the expected value. This is known as discount factor. Eta is strictly less than one. discount factor okay so this discount factor essentially is a mathematical way of saying that well what happens in the future I don't really care about it too much Okay, so if eta is very, very small, very close to zero, then you are essentially giving zero weight to the cost that you are going to accrue in the future. You are essentially saying, I don't care about what's going to happen in the future. Okay? Uh, typical, typically, if you talk about humans, they always have a high discount factor. So you want to consume more resources now, and you don't care much about what's going to happen in the future. Right? That's not a good policy, but that's what, that's how human decision making is okay um, to give you an example people have a lot of sugary drinks okay uh, even though <laughs> sorry Zawiyan. okay so people eat a lot of sugary have a lot of sugary drinks but if you look about it look at it from the total cost perspective in the future the medical cost is going to increase and if you take that into account, if your discount factor is equal to 1, you will take that into account when you're deciding whether or not you want to have a sugary drink today, like Coke or whatever, Pepsi or whatever. Okay? But people don't really think about it. They don't think about the cost of medical care that's going to be needed in the future to, for various diseases that you can get by drinking sugary uh, drinks. Okay? So, so humans, by their very nature, okay, by the very fact that we are animals, Okay, or social animals, <laughs> uh, we have a very high discount, we have a very low discount factor, 
but but I, I try to have a high discount factor, okay, as much as I can, uh, okay. But uh, people generally, if you're designing systems for human beings, you have to take into account that they don't really care about what cost they are going to incur in the future, okay. But but that's 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 based on human decision making. That's how uh, this discount this idea of discount factor was proposed. But in reality, mathematically, you need a discount factor so as to come up with a finite cost, okay? If you don't have a discount factor, your cost may be infinite for any reasonable policy that you might want to have, okay? So, so there are two real significance. One is mathematical. You want the expected cost to be finite. The other one is more coming from the human psychology where we say that we don't care about the future. Okay, so that would be an infinite horizon discounted MDP. Now, if this function doesn't depend on time, so of course here I have not written function as a, this, this state transition function F as a function of time. So if F doesn't depend on time, and this G here doesn't depend on time, so I can safely remove this T parameter here, uh, then it's known as stationary Markov decision problem. Okay, uh, we also need HT to be this full information case. Okay, so that would be a stationary MDP, discounted MDP. Why stationary? Well, the noise distribution doesn't, doesn't change with time. F doesn't change with time. The cost G doesn't change with time. The discount factor eta doesn't change with time. Okay, so it's called a stationary MDP. Okay, yeah. Sorry? So the distribution of noise doesn't depend on time. F doesn't depend on time. G here doesn't depend on time, that's the cost function. And eta doesn't depend on time. Eta is a constant for the entire horizon. Right. No, no. I, I mean, there is there is something there, but I don't want to get into that. Okay, it's called strong time consistency. Okay, but I don't want to talk about it. Uh, we can either talk offline or you can read up online about strong time consistency. Uh, but that's a different issue. Okay, I don't want to spend time on that. Okay. What is the problem you see with this model? Okay, I have this model. Okay, nothing is dependent on time except for history. And the history grows. Okay, as time progresses, the history grows. And so if t is equal to infinity, what is the problem here? Okay, I need to keep track of, I need to store the entire set of state and action pairs until time t. Okay, that's a lot of information. If you're playing chess, for instance, your state would be what, uh, uh, so it'll be the configuration of the chess board, okay, at every point of time. That's a lot of information. And you have to store that information and you have to store what actions you have taken, what moves you have made in the past, all the way until time t. Okay, of course, it's not an infinite horizon problem, right? But, uh, uh, but still, that's a lot of information that you need to store. So what would be a good simplification? What would you ideally like to have? Sorry? Keep a window. Keep a window which means remember everything from t minus h t minus whatever k all the way up to t. That's an option, okay, keep a window of information and throw away whatever has happened in the past. That's an option, yes. Okay, so that's going to reduce the amount of information you have and thereby your policies can be made simpler. But is there a loss by restricting the policy? See, if you have the entire history, so let's say I am solving this problem and I keep the entire history, 
and you have a bad memory, let's say, and you are removing everything that happened t minus k, everything before t minus k, would you do better than me or I do better than you? What do you think? Actually, it does not. Doesn't depend on any of, it doesn't depend on initial state, doesn't depend on anything else. Okay? It turns out that you can throw away all the information except the current state and there is no loss in performance. Okay? So that's known as memoryless policy. So let's talk about that. Okay? So the question is, so the question we try to, we want to understand is, should we remember everything? Okay, and the answer is no. Okay, we don't need to remember everything. So here is the main, main result. In fact, there is another issue, okay? The other issue is, remember, that an infinite horizon, my j, depends on gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, all the way up to gamma infinity. If I'm trying to solve this problem, let's say I, I said that, well, we don't need to know the entire history, okay? All we need to know, uh, we don't need to know the entire history, all we need to know is the current time, uh, current state you would still come back and argue that fine, I am, I'm going to remove everything from whatever I know, okay, except the current state, but I still need to remember the policy. Okay, I, need, I need to remember gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, all the way up to gamma infinity. So that's again a lot of storage space needed to, to uh, minimize this cost function, expected cost function. So it turns out that we want to look for memoryless which is gamma t is a function of x t to a t and then you have stationary which is gamma which maps x to a since x t and a t are all the same okay the state space doesn't change with time the action space doesn't change with time so you look for a stationary policy where gamma t is equal to gamma for all t. Okay, so your policy also doesn't change with time. Okay. So there are a lot of conceptual leaps here that we have made. We started with a system, a stationary system, a Markov uh, decision problem where I have a lot of history, okay, I remember everything that happened in the past, and I have this infinite cost, infinite horizon cost, where I have to keep track of a lot of strategies, okay, a lot of policies, at every point of time I have to remember the policy. I'm going to simplify it by saying, I'm going to be memoryless, so all I need is the current time step, the current state, and I'm going to be stationary, which means gamma t is going to be the same gamma for all time steps t. And the theorem is for finite horizon, so t less than infinity implies a stationary, there exists a stationary optimal policy. Uh, not stationary, sorry, memoryless. Less optimal policy uh, that is optimal in the entire class of policies with memory.
Okay. Okay. So that's a very big result. Okay, that's a big result because I don't need to remember the past history. I can be memoryless. All I need to be is all I need to have is the current state that maps to the current action. And that would be an optimal policy in the entire class of policies with memory. So no matter whether you have memory or not, you would still remain optimal. Okay, even without memory, you are as optimal as you would be if you had memory. Okay, does that make sense? No, doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I, see, see, this is a very difficult proof. Uh, we we will not cover the proof in the class, but this is the main takeaway: memoryless policy. So the best memoryless policy is optimal in the entire class of policies with memory. Okay. That's a substantial simplification of our original problem. Okay, so that's the first result. And the second result is when T is infinity, which means you are in an infinite horizon setting, then there exists a memoryless stationary policy that is optimal in the entire class of non-stationary non-stationary policies. Okay, so that's the key word here, memoryless stationary policy. Okay, so let's stare at these two statements for some time. So if I have finite horizon, I still need to keep track of gamma naught star all the way up to gamma t star. Okay, so for finite horizon I need to keep track of, I, I need to remember all the policies even though they are memoryless. Okay, so the, the requirement on storage is not that much as far as the history is concerned but I still need to remember the policies. In this case, we don't even have to remember the time varying policies. All I have to remember is gamma star that maps the state space to the action space. That's it. Okay. And this policy would be optimal in the class of all non-stationary policies that might depend on the entire history of state and action pairs. Okay. So this really is the reason why many people nowadays uh, are trying to solve problems of this type, okay? Problems where you have infinite horizon, you have discount factor, okay? And the problem is stationary. So none of these things change with time. And the reason for that is all you need to keep track of is a single map, gamma star, okay? But of course the challenge is that people are trying to solve right now, I, I mean the, the problems that people are trying to solve right now have the state space that are extremely large, so x is of the order of 10 raised to 20 and the action space is also very large, okay, but not as large as the state space. So, so the current state, current research is 
solve for gamma star in case x is 10 raised to 20. Okay, that is really the current state of the art uh, at the moment. This kind of state space is normally seen in, in games like chess or, or poker and so on. Okay? So, very huge state space. People are trying to solve this problem because there is substantial simplification going from here to here. You don't need to remember everything that has happened so far. All you need to remember is the current state and you don't need to change your policy with time. All you need to know is one policy and you can apply it over the entire period of time and you would still be guaranteed optimal. Okay. So that's the idea here. Any question? Yes. Well, in that case, in chess, the cost function is fairly simple. It's a terminal cost. There is no running cost. And all you want to do is win the game. Okay. So, chess really should be viewed as a finite horizon problem because there is an end to the game. Right. Uh, actually, you could have a situation where you get into some sort of deadlock. Okay. So, there are other, you know, uh, other situation that could arise, but uh, but the problem is fairly difficult for chess because you can't do dynamic programming that I'm going to describe now. You can't do it for the game of chess. Okay, but you can. I mean, if you have unlimited computational power, you can for every possible terminal state where you let's say you are playing the game of chess for every possible terminal config terminal configuration of the chessboard, you can do a dynamic programming and figure out what your optimal policy should be at every point of time, okay, given that it's a terminal, there is a time t at which you want to end the game. Now, in the game theory literature, it has been proven that in a game of chess, you always have a strategy, each player has a strategy that can force a winning strategy okay so that has been proven mathematically nobody knows what that policy is okay okay but it has been proven that there is a policy so that if you if you use that policy you will always win no matter what the other player does okay sorry well how do they do do it for chess Oh, so they okay. So what they do is Monte Carlo search. So they they figure out what the adversary is going to, what moves the adversary is going to take, and then they try to solve for optimal strategy at the current moment. Yeah, it's not an exhaustive search. Yeah, so that's where the current research is focusing at this moment. Tyler, no, no. Well. Actually, yeah, I mean, stationary in some sense implies memory less too, yeah. Yeah, yeah but stationary says your strategy doesn't change with time, but yes, if your strategy doesn't change, then the input to the strategy has to be the same variable at every point of time, yeah. Okay, any other question? Right. You don't need the current state XT encodes all the information that is needed for you to move optimally. Oh, so in finite horizon problems, you can always have, so the terminal cost changes a lot of things, okay. Uh, 
if you remember from the dynamic programming equation when you had a terminal cost uh, i don't know if you is this part of the current assignment the back the dynamic programming thing so it's part of the current assignment so you will see that as you move backward as you find out the optimal strategy at time capital t and then at t minus 1 and then at t minus 2 you will see that there is some effect of the terminal cost that seeps into the problem okay so because you have terminal cost your final state strategy is not going to be the same as the strategy at t minus 1 which is not going to be the same as strategy at t minus 2 and so on okay but when you have no final cost which is the case here okay and the cost remains stationary over the entire time which means that the cost doesn't depend on time then this entire recursion would actually converge to a fixed point and that fixed point would be uh, gamma star okay and how do you prove that bana contraction mapping theorem okay so so we'll we'll get to it in a bit okay so is this clear to everyone okay so now of course the next question is i have this state transition function i have the cost function i have the discount factor how do i compute the finite horizon optimal policy and how do i compute the infinite horizon optimal policy right that's an obvious question to ask so let's do that so first of all somebody gave us this this big theorem which says that i can concentrate on just memory less policies i don't have to keep track of the entire history so that's good now what have we learned in the theory of dynamic programming well if you have a finite horizon problem start with the final time step and then proceed backward so we define the value function v of capital t at x of capital t as so typically you would put h of capital t here but since we don't really need the entire history all we need is the current state i'm going to write x of t here and that would be minimum of u capital t of expected value of gt xt ut plus gt plus 1 xt plus 1 okay and xt plus 1 is actually f of xt ut wt okay so xt is something that's given ut is what you are minimizing over and wt is the only random variable here which uh, and you are taking the expectation with respect to this random variable wt and of course your gamma star capital t of xt will be equal to the argmin of u capital t of this expression okay and then so this this does the optimization for the terminal uh, time step so capital t and then you define vt which is a function of xt as minimum of ut expected value of gt xt ut plus vt plus 1 xt plus 1 okay and you do the same thing as you did earlier okay just replace the future cost with the cost of the optimal value function at the next time step okay so the only difference from the deterministic dynamic programming is the expectation operator here okay since you don't know what's going to happen in the future exactly as was the case in the deterministic setting you take the expectation with respect to all possible future uncertainty 
okay, and you proceed backward. So that was simple. Let's look at the infinite horizon setting. You can, because it doesn't doesn't really participate in this expectation. Okay, so that's uh, that's the finite horizon setting. Let's look at the infinite horizon setting. So I am going to define an operator t from r x to r x, and this is known as the Bellman operator. Okay, and the way I'm going to define it is T of V of X is min over U G of X U plus eta expected value of V of F X U W. Okay, so your, this variable, this value function v actually sits in Rx, which is essentially the set of all possible value functions from x to r. Okay, so I define this Bellman operator that operates on the space of value functions. Oh, I should take the minimum with respect to this whole thing. Okay, so this is the current running cost evaluated at uh, x and at u. So x is a value in, x is in capital X. So I have evaluated at x and at u and then I add the discount factor multiplied by the expected value, expect, expectation of the future value, okay? So this is the future state. The value evaluated at the future state, take the expectation, multiplied by the discount factor, add it all up. You get what is known as the uh, Bellman operator. Bellman operator is a nonlinear operator. Why? Because you're taking a minimization over a finite set. So it's a nonlinear operator. And the way you find out the value function, the overall uh, stationary value function of the entire decision process is you run it as Vt plus one equals T Vt, okay? You run it infinite number of times, okay? So this is the iteration, you run it infinite number of times and you hope that this will converge to some v infinity. This converts to some v infinity, which is the optimal value function for the infinite horizon problem. But how would you prove that this will converge to v infinity? How would you prove that? Banach contraction mapping theorem, okay? You show that T is a contraction map with contraction coefficient eta. Eta is strictly less than one so t is less than one, oh, sorry, the contraction coefficient of t is less than one. So vt plus one equals tvt will converge to some value v infinity. And then you have to show that v infinity is optimal for the overall problem. It turns out that it is. And your gamma star of x will be argument of g plus expected value, eta expected value of v infinity 
of the whole thing. Okay, so instead of v here, you put the v infinity here, and you take the argument, and you get gamma star of x. Okay, so that's the algorithm for computing uh, the optimal policy, and this is known as value iteration algorithm. This is value iteration. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So as you can see, even though you weren't happy when I taught Banach contraction mapping theorem, it's really a very powerful tool because you can prove in very, very, in very different settings. You can come up with, uh, you can use Banach contraction mapping to prove the optimality of something. Okay, as t goes to infinity. So in this case also we use Banach contraction mapping theorem. In fact, all of you might have studied root locus, right? So you increase the gain and sometimes system becomes unstable and so on. You're essentially, in that case also, you can prove the result by Banach contraction mapping theorem. Essentially you are trying to move the eigenvalues, okay? And as you know, eigenvalues are very much related to the contraction coefficient of a contraction map, right? So in some sense, root locus is also trying to use ideas from Banach contraction mapping theorem to devise an optimal controller, not an optimal controller, but a controller that stabilizes the system. So in some sense, that's also a Banach contraction mapping. Uh, that's an application of Banach contraction mapping theorem. So anyways, I wanted to show you, uh, besides the value iteration algorithm and MDP, I wanted to show you that you can use Banach contraction mapping theorem here as well, okay? and that's the that's a brief introduction to uh, MDPs. And next class, I'll talk about uh, multi-arm bandit problems, which are problems where you don't quite know the distributions. You don't quite know the distribution of WT. In fact, there is no there is no state equation, but there is some uh, there is some system that you are exploring, and at the same time. While you are exploring, you also are accumulating reward, and you want to somehow maximize the reward by picking an appropriate uh, policy of behavior. Uh, so we'll talk about it in the next class. So there, there, you see a tension between exploitation and exploration. Okay, so you want to exploit the information you have received, but you also want to continue exploring other environments uh, so as to maximize your total expected reward. So we'll we'll talk about it in the next class. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to come to me and try to answer them. Thank you.